knows what is good for man in this life? That's where we left off yesterday at the end of chapter 6 and verse 12. Solomon now goes into answering this question for us, his readers. And with that question posed before us, he goes in in chapter 7 to list all the things that are better, all the things that are good. In fact, he says this word good or better 14 times in chapter 7 because he's really trying to drive home this point of what it is that's good, what it is that's better, what it is that man should pursue. And ultimately, it's wisdom that enables all these good things or all these better things. It's wisdom that man should be pursuing after. Solomon stated this early on, back in chapter 2 and verse 13, when we looked at his executive summary in our first class. And we saw the fact that wisdom was the only thing that had profit. Of all the things that he looked at, everything was vanity. Everything was empty and amounted to nothing. But wisdom, wisdom was the one thing that had profit. Well, he identifies that again in chapter 7 and verse 11 today. And in chapter 7 and verse 12, but what is the value of wisdom? He's hinted around it, but he hasn't really discussed it in detail because up to this point, he's been focused on his own experience. He's been focused on the observations that he's been making in life, his consideration of time. But now he's going to consider wisdom. Well, with wisdom, there's a lasting value. And will wisdom fix the problems of this life? That's the question that Solomon has. And at the beginning of his journey, he thought, yes, Wisdom has the answer to everything. Well, he's going to come to a bit of a different conclusion in today's chapter. But let's look first in the first ten verses to see the things that are better, the things that are good that wisdom enables. He starts with a good name being better than precious ointment. A good name or a good reputation being better than the most costly and expensive perfume. We know that perfume is difficult to make, that it's expensive, and that it has a fragrance and an aroma that's very pervasive. But he says a good name, a good reputation is more pervasive than even the best perfume, and that its aroma will last longer than even the very best that those can offer. He goes on to say that the day of one's death is, the better, than, is better than the day of one's birth. And you think, well, that sounds kind of cryptic, doesn't it? What's he talking about here? He says, well, that's the only time that you can truly assess someone's reputation is at the end of their life because along the way there's many pitfalls and it's very easy to ruin a good reputation. It's not hard to ruin a reputation, but it's very hard to gain and maintain a good reputation. And it's only at the end of one's life that the life's work, the culmination of their life can truly be assessed as to what type of reputation that individual has. He continues on in verses 2 through 7 to talk about the fact that soberness is better than laughter. He said it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting in verse 2. Better to go to a funeral than to a party. And if you go out and ask the common person on the street, pick however many people you want to ask as a sample size and say, where would you rather go? We're having this party over here. We're having this funeral over here. I don't think you even need to conduct the experiment because everybody's going to say, yeah, I want to go to the party. I'm not interested in the funeral. But Solomon says, even though you think that the party's more enjoyable, that it's more fun, a lot of those things cause you to escape from thinking about life. But a funeral, a funeral makes you think because it shows you that this life does not continue on forever. In fact, it makes you consider your own life. And those instances in life that cause us to stop and consider are the ones that Solomon says have the greatest value. In essence, it's the lesson of Psalm 90 in verse 12, isn't it? Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. In essence, Solomon's saying that it's better to be painfully aware of the brevity of this life than just to continue moving through life without ever stopping to think because we'll reflect on our own lives to see what we're doing, to realize that time is limited, and to make the best of our time. He goes on to say in verse 5 that it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for the singing of fools. The singing of fools is enjoyable. It's a good time. It's not fun to be rebuked. It's not enjoyable to be told that you're doing something wrong, but he says 
that has a better long-term benefit. Because in verse 6, it's like the crackling of the thorns under a pot, this raucous laughter of the fool. People who just laugh and have a good time without really thinking. It's like taking a, a thorn bush, a bunch of dried out nettles, and placing them underneath the pot. There's a lot of excitement, a big flash of light, a lot of crackling that occurs, but try to boil a pot of water. No ability to do real work. Nothing of value. Just a quick flash and it's gone. Nothing remains. Nothing profitable. He goes on in verses 8 through 10 to talk about patience being better than rashness. Better is the end than the beginning, similar to the day of one's death versus the day of one's birth. Because it's at the end that the value can truly be assessed. At the beginning, we make many goals. We have many aspirations. But we're all familiar with the phrase that when all is said and done, there's often more said than done. And he said it's only at the end that you can truly assess what's been accomplished and what's been completed. <clears throat> And he says something in verse 10 that's very wise to heed. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Don't dwell on the past. Don't think about the good old days as being better than today. Because there's a phrase or a quote that says that the good old days are often based on bad old memories. And we can have a way of romanticizing the past, accentuating those features that we found positive while forgetting the ones that were negative. And the reality of what it actually was like may be very different than what it is today. A biblical example of that is the children of Israel in the wilderness, of where they looked back to Egypt. And they said, oh, we want to go back to Egypt because of all the leeks and the melons, the fish, the garlic. What about all the slavery? What about the oppression? What about crying out to God? Well, those things were all forgotten because they were only thinking about the things that they enjoyed, the things that they wanted. But even if the past was truly better than the present, Solomon says you can't bring the past back. You have the present to deal with. You're much better to focus on the situation that you have at hand than to wish for the past. Keep moving forward. So Solomon's been talking about the benefits associated with wisdom up to this point. But now in verse 11, he specifically begins to talk about wisdom. He talked about it back in chapter 2 and verse 13 in his executive summary. And now he talks it here in chapter 7 and verse 11. In 7 and verse 11, he says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. That word in verse 12, excellency, is the same as profit in verse 11. Two more times now he's saying that it has profit, that it has benefit, that wisdom is good with an inheritance, but it's only for those who see the sun. Only for those who lift their eyes above this life to see the purpose and what this life is trying to accomplish. It's not worldly wisdom that Solomon's talking about here. He's talking about the wisdom that comes from God. But what is the profit? He said, okay, there's profit, but we've been waiting through the whole book to hear well, what is the profit of wisdom. And he says in verse 12 that it gives life to those who have it. Wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the profit of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to those who have it. But is that life now? Is it longevity now? Or is it something beyond this life? That's the question to answer. And Solomon's hammering on this point. This is a major finding that Solomon's coming to in the book. He's lamented at numerous points in his life that nothing, every single pathway that he goes down, every way that he pursues leads to nothing. There's no profit. But now he's identified one thing. Godly wisdom is the only thing that has any lasting value. It's able to give life. And he considers what type of life it's able to be able to give. But he says, where do you get this wisdom from? Well, the prerequisite in verse 12 is knowledge. And in verse 13, considering the work of God. Considering the work of God because this is the wisdom that comes from God, from reading God's word, from contemplating his things, from meditating on his precepts. But Solomon says in verse 13, who can make that straight? which she hath made crooked. 
The present age, though, is crooked. It's unfair. And God's allowed it to be such, but for a very specific reason. The reason that he's allowed it to be this way is so that man might find that there's nothing after him, is what it says at the end of verse 14. That there's nothing beyond God. In fact, God purposely puts good and adversity, good and evil, side by side into the life of the believer. And Solomon's saying that this can be a major source of frustration because we're going up and down on this roller coaster of life. One day things seem to be going well, and the next day we're inundated with trials and adversities. Solomon says that's not by accident. That's the way that God works in verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. That's the same word, prosperity and joyful. In the day of good, be good. But in the day of adversity, which is that word evil that comes up so many times, consider. So he says when prosperity comes, when good things come, be content. But when bad things come, be reflective. Consider. God has put these two things together so that you might learn to look to him for the answer and not to yourself. God wants us to approach him in life, not just at times when we can't find any other way and when we're in desperation turn to him. He wants us to turn to him in every aspect of life. Think through scriptural examples of where people, even great men of faith, thought, you know what, this is a pretty simple one. I think I can handle this one without inquiring of God. You have Joshua at Ai, for example. And the disaster that occurs there, not denigrating the character of Joshua, but reiterating the fact that no matter how simple it seems to us, God wants us to turn to him. The Gibeonites, another example. And you can go through numerous examples in scripture. God wants us to realize that there's nothing beyond him. He wants us to turn to him in every situation in life. But this is the conundrum of life, isn't it? Ultimate wisdom has the answer to everything. It can give life to those that have it. But ultimate wisdom is beyond us. It belongs to God. So we really can't figure out why everything's happening the way it is or what we're supposed to be taking away from the situations that always come into our lives. And so we observe these inconsistencies in life. In verse 15, Solomon now returns. All things have I seen, is what he says in verse 15. And so he's saying, well, this is what I've come to understand, but let's take a look at practical life to see where this is demonstrated. And he says, well, what I see demonstrated is a contradiction. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There's a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. He says there's a person that lives by principles, and they actually die young because of those principles. And then there's a wicked person that doesn't just happen to live long. They actually live long by prolonging it in their wickedness. Through wickedness, they secure for themselves a long and prosperous life. So what are we supposed to take away from this? Solomon's told us that wisdom is the answer. Wisdom gives life, but then he's showing examples of where that's not the case, of where living a righteous life can actually result in a premature death, and living a wicked life can result in a longer life. So what are we supposed to take away from this? And if you're anything like me, when I read this and I was contemplating it, I sat back a bit confused and I thought, Solomon, I thought you were setting me up here for the answer. This was the answer of what it was that I was supposed to take away from life. But instead, you've been showing me that that's not the case, that there's frustration and anxiety. I was thinking, yes, this is something that I can sink my teeth into. But now he's saying, perhaps this is another dead end. Is that what he's saying? And I think Solomon knows where he's bringing us. Because once again, he says, this is what I'm saying to you in verses 16 to 18. Remember back in chapter five, when he brought us to a similar place of where we were just thinking, well, what is the answer? There's no solution to the inequities of life, to the unfairness. He says, living with God is the answer. Well, now he does the same thing here in regards to wisdom in verses 16 to 18. Look at what he says. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth 
of them all. He's telling us some very specific things. Even though you're not going to be able to figure it out, here's what you need to do when you're living out your life now. He said, don't be self-righteous. Don't be righteous over much. That doesn't mean don't try to be too righteous. It's okay to not be super righteous. He says, don't think that you're really righteous. Don't be self-righteous because that results in hypocrisy. Don't be conceited. Don't think that you're really wise. Be humble. He says in the next verse, in verse 17, be not over much wicked. The English there is a bit difficult to understand. He's not saying a little wickedness is okay. He's saying, don't be wicked. Avoid it. Avoid wickedness and foolishness because through foolishness you can actually shorten your lifespan by doing things in the wrong way. And so the lesson in verse 18 is to examine ourselves. It's good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thy hand. He says it's very difficult to keep the right balance. To go away from evil on the one hand and to pursue righteousness on the other without becoming self-righteous without becoming conceited. But he's saying a constant self-examination enables you to have the right balance as you press forward, as you try to understand the conundrums of this life, of the good and the evil, of the prosperity and the adversity that are always facing us, juxtaposed against each other in our lives. And that comes through a fear of God, that the fear of God provides the proper view of ourself and a confidence in salvation. Because look at what he says at the end there. He says, He that feareth God shall come forth of them all. This is a major realization as well that Solomon's bringing to each one of us. He's saying that this life is not about this life. Solomon is now beginning to look beyond this life. And yes, wisdom brings life, but he's saying it's not really in this life because he's pointed to examples of where that's not the case. But now he's saying that he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. What's he talking about? Well, he must be expanding his scope beyond this life. He must be starting to look to the future to answer the questions of this life, of things will not be reconciled in this life. In our short lifespan, the inequities of life will not be corrected. All the loose ends will not be tied up, even with godly wisdom. Even when you commit your life to God and you pursue God's wisdom, it will not spare you of dealing with the difficulties in this life, is what Solomon's saying. And this is part of development. God's designed many things in nature that actually exemplify this principle. For example, athletes, when they train, if you were to just do the same workout every single day, never increase the intensity, never change the workout, you would only achieve a certain level of fitness, a certain level of performance, but you would never achieve excellence. Now they do things called muscle confusion, of where you bring different types of exercises, different intensities, to try to make sure that that muscle is developing, that that individual is developing in many different ways, so that it doesn't just become one particular set of action. That's the same way that God works spiritually, of bringing at times confusion into our lives, of where we're dealing with a situation, we're dealing with a weakness, and we begin to think, yes, I understand now. I think I'm making progress in this area. And suddenly something else comes into our life and bombards us and confuses us. What is this supposed to be? But God's switching things up. He's changing things around. Prosperity and adversity, trying to get us to develop so that we can achieve excellence. Not in our strength, but in His strength. It's all part of the process. God wants us to look to him. And now Solomon's beginning to do that. He's beginning to look to God. And he's changing the scope from being under the sun to chapter 7 and verse 11, seeing the sun. But how can Solomon truly say what he says at the end of verse 18? How can he say, he that feareth God shall come forth of them all? Solomon said at the beginning of his study, that he was going to base everything on data, whether it was his own experience, his observations in life, any conclusion that he draws is gonna be based on data. So what data does Solomon have to support this? Well, the data of this life says the opposite, right? It doesn't say that wisdom brings life. It says the opposite. So 
The only thing that Solomon can be using to substantiate this is faith. Now Solomon never calls it faith in the book of Ecclesiastes. It won't appear in the word cloud. But there's evidence all throughout the book that Solomon is saying that faith is necessary if you're truly going to understand God, if you're truly going to come forth of them all. Because as wise as Solomon was, he's getting to the point of where he's realizing he can't figure it out himself. Take a look at what he says in verses 23 and 24. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Instead, he concludes in verse 29, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Many inventions they've sought out, is what Solomon said. I tried to find ultimate wisdom. I thought I could figure it out. God's given me all the tools that I needed to figure it out. But when I went to investigate it, when I pursued every pathway, I found that it was far from me. It escaped me. And the only thing that I found out, the only real thing that I found out, is that God made man upright. In the beginning, when God created man, he created man good. He made man upright. But man sought out many inventions. Man tried to create something that God did not. Man grasped for equality with God. And he created a world of vanity. That's what Solomon figured out based on his assessment and based on his journey for ultimate wisdom. This is what he says at the end of chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is neither day nor night see asleep with his eyes. He said, I've lost many nights, sleepless nights, trying to figure this out. Verse 17, then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a man, a wise man, think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. This is very significant for Solomon to come forward. And we just read over it quickly. But this is essentially Solomon admitting failure. Solomon saying that he can't fulfill the mission that he set out to accomplish at the beginning. It's not going to work. I've exhausted every pathway, and it's beyond me. Solution to this life lay beyond this life. And Solomon conceded that faith is required to be able to truly understand it. But how many of us struggle with exactly the same thing in our lives? We all recognize that faith is necessary, but none of us really want to have faith. None of us want to rely on somebody else to improve things in our life. Now that's not something that we would say, but let's face it, we all want to depend on ourselves to fix our own problems. We don't want to be dependent on somebody else. Yet over time and throughout our lives, God brings circumstances into our lives, time and time again, of where we're brought to this same realization that Solomon's brought to, that it's beyond us, that we don't have the solutions to even our own problems and the things that we face. We seek to be wise. We seek to figure out the answers, but we find that it's far from us. Now, this can be very discouraging if we trust in ourselves. And if we are discouraged by this, it reveals to us that we're not really putting our faith in God. We're not really trusting in Him to the level that He requires of us. But if we're pursuing the fear of God and revering Him in our lives, then we know that these circumstances are humbling us, that they're exercising us in the way that He desires, that we might be more like Him. And these things, these circumstances, become the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And just as faith was a major finding in Solomon's life, it's a major finding in our lives as well. Not from the standpoint of acknowledging that, yes, faith is important and I need faith. I'm not talking about just an intellectual understanding. I'm talking about the recognition in reality of where we truly recognize that faith is necessary. If when we come to a situation in our life and we look down the road and we say, I can't see any solution to this problem. 
Sometimes we look down the path and we see, you know, if A, B, or C happens, then I can see this working out, and I'm going to have faith that God's going to make this work out. That's not faith. That's something that we see. But each one of us is brought to points in our life of where we look down the road and we see a black hole. We don't see an answer to the problem. But that's what faith is, is when we believe that God can accomplish the impossible. And that's where Solomon was getting in his journey, of where he looked down the path and he didn't see how he could answer this question for himself. All he saw was a dead end. And each one of us is brought to this hard realization at multiple points in our life. God brings multiple circumstances into our lives, not to destroy us, but to teach us this fundamental lesson to have faith in Him and to trust in Him. It can be sickness. It can be family turmoil. Life's iniquities or inequities, the unfair things that we experience, our own character flaws, ecclesial turmoil that seems to go on without any end or even our own mortality. All these things bring us to this realization. But even though Solomon doesn't call it faith, what else could it be than faith? And so I began to think, is this just something that I'm inserting into the record, that Solomon is talking about faith? And so I went through the book of Ecclesiastes to try to understand where else within the book does Solomon make conclusions without really showing any supporting data? And I found that there's quite a few of those that occur. There's a few aspects of faith that he brings up. One is the precursor to faith, which is acknowledging that you can't figure it all out. There's numerous verses that speak about that, but here's just a couple in chapter 8 and verse 7 and chapter 8 and verse 17, where he says, man doesn't really know what's going to happen after him. This is the precursor for faith, of recognizing that you just can't really figure it out yourself. That you can do a certain amount. You can exercise wisdom in discerning the right time to do things. But to figure out the answer to everything lay beyond our ability. He then goes on to talk about faith in two different regards. Faith in a future judgment that God will eventually make things right. That God will heal this earth. That he will judge the good and the evil. That primarily takes place in chapter 8. A very focused consideration there. And then in chapter 9, he talks about faith in the hand of providence, of how God brings the individual to that day, of how God works in the life of individuals now to prepare them for the time of the future. And I know that there's a lot here, and I'd be happy to come back to this a bit later. But what we see is a few examples here in this particular instance of where Solomon's talking about faith in a future judgment. Faith in a resurrection, faith in a reward of where he makes statements, but the data from his life don't really support the statements that he's making. He says, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked in chapter 3 in his consideration of time. How did he see that in his life? He didn't. He saw the opposite occurring. Chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, even after you commit your life to God, even after you've committed to living with him, You're going to see things continue on that aren't fair. But don't worry, because he that is higher than the highest regardeth. God sees those things. And the implication is he's going to require them. Chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, he says, Wisdom gives life to those who have it. In what sense? Well, in the eternal sense. Because he says in chapter 7 and verse 18, He that feareth God shall come forth of them all. We see this continuing in chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, of where he says, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, I know that it shall be well with him that fears God. Because we don't have time to get into the specifics of chapter 8, let's just turn there for a moment (coughs) and consider this series of verses. Sorry about the voice here. Verses 12 and 13, there's a bit of a contrast that occurs here. In verse 12, he says, Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with him, or with them that fear God, which fear before him. So he says the sinner's prolonging his days, but he knows it's going to be well with him that fears God. In the very next verse, he says, But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not God. So in verse 12, he says the wicked's prolonging his days, 
But in verse 13, he says it's not going to be well with them because they're not going to prolong their days. So how are we supposed to make sense of that? Well, he says in verse 12, in this life, the wicked may be prolonging their life and their wickedness. They may get their 70 years out of this life. But in verse 13, if you extend that timeline into eternity, 70 years begins to look pretty small. And it begins to fade into oblivion, into a shadow, into something that's passing away. Solomon is beginning to look beyond this life. He's no longer just looking under the sun. He's now seeing the sun. He's seeing the purpose. And he's saying, in faith, you have to believe that God is going to require what's been done now. And in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, he says, God shall bring every work into judgment. Once again, a future judgment. But he says, okay, this is what God's going to do on the macroscopic scale. But what about on the microscopic scale? What about in the life of individuals? How is providence going to work in your life? How does God secure that you get from this life to the life in the future? And he talks specifically about that in chapter 9. There's a couple things that he says in chapter 3 and in chapter 7 of where God has given things to the sons of men to exercise them, to develop them, to humble them. That God has set one against the other, good things and bad things, to teach us about God. But in chapter 9, that's where the focused effort comes in, of where he says the righteous, the wise, and their works are in the hand of God, that God's hand is overshadowing the righteous and guiding them to the kingdom. And in 9 and verse 7, God has already accepted of what you do. God approves of what you're doing. God has designed things a certain way, and when you live according to those principles, God approves of them. Faith and providence is coming forward. And so because we're running short, we're not going to take a look, unfortunately, at chapter 8. But I would like to consider chapter 9 in the moments that remain, of taking a look at this aspect of providence as it comes out. When we come to chapter 9, you have to remember that Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of somebody standing upon earth. It's not written from the perspective of God declaring something from heaven and showing man what's right. It's written from the perspective of Solomon standing on earth and trying to figure things out. So what he says at the beginning of chapter 9 is that as a result of his journey, as a result of everything in his discovery path that he's been going through, he's going to declare this. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this. And that word declare means to explain. So now I'm going to explain something to you. He says in chapter 9 and verse 1, The righteous, the wise, and their works are in the hand of God. I'm going to explain this concept to you. So the rest of chapter 9 is all about the explanation for how the righteous, the wise, and their works are in the hand of God. This is a fundamental truth that Solomon is explaining, a fundamental truth that needs to be understood to make sure that we know how providence works. But the problem is, At the end of verse 1, that no man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Because why? Because in verse 2, all things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous and to the wicked. So if you're just standing here on earth and you're looking around at people's lives, you can't tell if someone's righteous or wicked based on the things that are being brought into their life. This was the issue with Job's friends, of where they thought they could determine that Job was wicked because of the things that were taking place in his life. And Solomon says that's a great difficulty. Because based on the things of somebody's life, you can't tell if they're righteous or wicked based on those circumstances. So even though the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God, how can you figure that out if you really can't see it outwardly? And so he continues on, and he says in verse 3, There's an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Death is the end for all mankind, righteous or unrighteous. All things happen alike to all from the perspective of somebody standing on earth. But he says in verse 4, For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. And this is the only place in the book of Ecclesiastes where this word hope 
is used. This isn't the word to know, which is yada in the Hebrew. Solomon has declared many things that he knows throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. 36 times Solomon's used this word to know. But this is the only place in the book where he uses the word hope. Some things cannot be known. They have to be hoped for. And they have to be believed in. And that's what Solomon is explaining right off the bat regarding providence. Providence is not something that you know. It's not something that you can observe. It's something that you hope and that you believe in. Yes, we can see the hand of God at work in our lives, but we don't always know what it is that's trying to be accomplished. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, is what he continues on to say. And it sounds a bit cryptic that the living know that they're going to die doesn't sound a whole lot better than already being dead and not knowing anything. But Solomon's trying to accomplish something deeper than that. He's trying to say that if you know that you're going to die, if you know that your time is limited, then you need to make sure that you use that time. Because once it's gone, you're not going to know anything anymore. He says in verse 5, as he continues on, they have no more reward. It means no more wage. You can't earn a wage anymore because you can't work. You can't do anything once the grave comes. The memory of them is forgotten. They go the way of the rest of the earth. Generation after generation comes, as he started out the book in chapter 1, and they fly forgotten. People move on. The world keeps turning. He says in verse 6, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Those three emotions that are so responsible for many things in human existence, love, envy, hatred, that have driven so many things throughout the history of mankind, those things cease, and they come to an end when death ensues. And there's no more portion forever in anything that's done under the sun. That doesn't just apply to the unbeliever, of people who don't know God. That applies to us as well. Once this life is over, we can't go back to this life and try again. Solomon says you get one chance at it, one opportunity. And he's saying this is what you need to do based on that one opportunity. Even though you may not fully understand how providence is at work, you need to understand up front that it is at work, that the righteous, the wise, and their works are in the hand of God. And so here's what you need to do based on that. He goes on to talk about this in verse 7 through 10. This is where the confusion comes in, of understanding how God's hand is at work. If it's not always outwardly visible, what are we supposed to do about it? And he says in verses 7 to 10, this is what I'm saying to you. This is what I want you to take away from it. He says, go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. He says in verse 7, to accept God's blessings with joy and thankfulness. When he says that God now accepteth thy works, the English Standard Version says God has already approved of what you do. That God approves of us joyfully and thankfully receiving the blessings that he gives to us in this life. But just like everywhere else in the book of Ecclesiastes, he qualifies this very quickly in verse 8. He says in verse 8, let your garments always be white and your head lack no ointment. He says your garments need to be white. And when we look at Revelation 19 and verse 8, that's the righteousness of the saints. He says make sure as you're enjoying those things that you're doing it on the basis of living righteously and that you fill your minds with God's word. Head, ointment. Head lacking no ointment. That's from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 12, isn't it? With the virgins and the oil that they have. So make sure that as you're living this life and you're appreciating God's blessings, that you're showing that you appreciate it by living righteously and filling your mind, filling your life with God's word on a continual basis. In verse 9, he says, live joyfully. And my margin says, enjoy life with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Enjoy life with the spouse and the families that we have. Love is the basis for one of God's greatest blessings that he gives to us at this time. It's from God. God has given it. And this aspect of joy and service is something that God keys in on numerous points in the law. 
you read Isaiah 58 and you look at what the meaning of a true Sabbath is, a true Sabbath is one where somebody joyfully moves forward, keeping the will of God. He says, bring that joy into your family. Live that joy with your wife. Appreciate God's blessings and pass that heritage on. It's from God. God has given it to you. But remember, remember it's for this life. Don't become overly focused on this life. Remember, these blessings now are to prepare you for the life to come. Five times in this one verse, he emphasizes the fact that these blessings are fleeting and that they're passing away. Look at what he says. The life of thy vanity is the first time, which hath he hath given thee under the sun is the second time. All the days of thy vanity is the third time. Thy portion in this life is the fourth time, which thou takest under the sun is the fifth time. He's driving home. Yes, these are blessings to be appreciative of, but remember what these blessings are supposed to be pushing you toward, a time in the future. Because in verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Once this life is over, it's over. Fourteen times in these few verses, Solomon is saying, this is what I'm saying to you. And it's worth coloring in those words where Solomon's speaking to us. Thee, thou, thy. Because he wants us to take this message away. To use these opportunities, because even though knowledge is a prerequisite to wisdom, even though wisdom brings life, you're not going to have the opportunity to accumulate those things because once life is over, those opportunities are gone. Make sure that you're using those opportunities to the best of your abilities now. Put it into action. And so in verse 11, he returns and he says, what do I see in practical life? He looks under the sun and he sees that the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. The bread is not always to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Things don't always work out as they are anticipated to work out. But this question has raised a lot of interesting discussion over the years. And I spent a lot of time looking at this, trying to understand what is meant by time and chance and how time and chance are at work in the life of a believer. This whole chapter, what you have to remember, this whole chapter is Solomon explaining the principle of providence, that the righteous, the wise, and their works are in the hand of God. So everything has to be understood within that basis. If the righteous and the wise are in the hand of God, can anything happen in God's hand that he's not aware of? that he's not in control of. The Lord Jesus Christ says in John 10, verses 28 and 29, that none can pluck them out of my Father's hand. So whether God is specifically doing something or refraining from doing something, we are in the hand of God. None can pluck them from his hand. And we're given the assurance that all things, not some things, but all things happen for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. God is at work in the life of the righteous, creating the environment for them to be able to make the decisions. Free will exists within that environment of how we decide to respond to those events, but we are in the hand of God. Solomon also considers those that are under the sun, those that are going about in the cycles of life because God's created this world on the basis and created laws of physics that now keep this world in motion. And those who live under the sun are part of that system. They don't see anything higher than what they're living in today. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that God shows us that man without God is no different than the animals. Psalm 49 and verse 20, A man that is in honor but understandeth not is like the beast that perishes. And so people who don't understand God, who don't understand the purpose of this life, go the way of the rest of the earth. But there's a difference, isn't there, between the righteous and the wise and their works being in the hand of God and those who are not in the hand of God, who are living out their life to completion and going the way of the rest of the earth. That's how I've come to understand this foundation of providence and the way that God works in the life of believers. And Solomon closes out this section 
by saying that even though wisdom has significant value, even though wisdom will ultimately give life because it leads to a faith, a faith in God's providence that people don't value it in this present age. And he gives the example of a man who delivers his entire city, but this man is poor. People look at him and they say, this guy doesn't really have anything to offer. Except through his wisdom, he saves the city. But when it's all said and done, people forget about this poor man because he doesn't have anything in this life. People don't desire to be like this poor man. But Solomon says, even though people don't value it, it's of significant value, which is what he's going to go on to show in chapter 10 in our class, Tomorrow, Lord Willing. Because he's built up wisdom so much to this point in the book. So to bring it forward to us as readers that, look, wisdom isn't going to solve it all, that you do need faith. I believe that he's worried that he's going to devalue wisdom in the eyes of those reading the book. And so he comes back to wisdom in chapter 10 and says, no, wisdom does have real value. Make sure that you apply it in your life. But make sure as well that you're living wisely based on having faith in your life. So the summary from today is that wisdom is the only thing of lasting value. But wisdom alone cannot solve the issues of this life. Faith in God is needed to bridge the gap between what we can see and what we can't see. And fearing and revering God results in the reward that he spoke of. <clears throat> God's providence in our lives is designed to help to bring us to that future time, the future time that Solomon looked forward to, of when God will make all the wrongs right, of when he will judge and he will give a reward to those who are righteous. Solomon instructs us that even though we can't understand everything now, that we have to have faith in providence and we have to live in righteousness, being joyful in the service that we have before our Heavenly Father. But be aware that the results may not always align with the expected effort, that the things that we apply may not always result in what they think they're going to result in. Wisdom is not properly valued in this life, but make sure that you keep the proper valuation of wisdom in yours. So he tells us to pursue wisdom, faith, and godly fear. And one place where I thought that this principle came up in the New Testament was some of the writings of Paul in Colossians. In Colossians 3, of where he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, <clears throat> where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that the, of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Let's focus on those things which are above, lifting our eyes from the mundane things of this life, and focus on the reward that God has given to us. Focusing while there still is time, and there still is opportunity, serving him with all our might, and doing it joyfully, that we might partake in this reward from our Heavenly Father.